Um, I would like uh, now to welcome uh, Amina Mai. Amina Mai is our gender expert, and uh, she will um, she will talk, uh, she is uh, she will give a she will give a lecture, and she will address uh, uh, what does a gender perspective means and gender inclusive perspective means when we do research, um, in uh, when we do research and when we design uh, a design process. Uh, Amina is. Uh, um, an associate professor of um, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology of Carter University, and she does uh, a research on uh, women and health, racialization and biomedicalization of women's bodies and skin, anti-aging women, science and technology, political thought, sociology and gender, sociology of knowledge and gender and cin uh, cinema. Uh, of course, she can tell you, uh, she can provide you with a better introduction of herself. So I will say no more. And uh, please, Amina, uh, the mic is yours. Um, let's turn the video off. Thank you. Amina, your microphone's off still. Pretty well. So now I can you now hear me? That's it. Yeah, we can hear you now. I'm just going to make you host so you can share your screen. Thank you very much. Okay, so I will not yet share it. I will just give a, maybe a few minutes um, a framing of my discussion. Then I will uh, share the uh, the, um, the 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 viewing. Yes. So let me start uh, saying that. Um, I really like people are uh, um, uh, situating themselves. So I am um, also, my accent is an African. I am from Somalia. Uh, my last name is actually Miri, which is very hard for Anglo speakers or people who learn uh, uh, English through Anglo. I find the Italians and the uh, Latin speaking Europeans usually call my name Miri since in the uh, Latin the word E pronounces. So. The name is Mewe and is distinctly Somali. And uh, my accent, uh, even though I have been here for quite a while, I still carry my accent. And that is uh, a Somali accent. I have um, prepared a lesson, a, a lecture, that's a more of a provocative intervention, not so much as a prolegomena for how to design a gender inclusive uh, platform but what not to do. So my lecture is um, a quick intervention, a quick summary of some of the important moments in women and gender in Western, what I call technological modernity. And we'll uh, flag that we need to avoid um, uh, uh, falling into, into uh, those pitfalls that we need to, to actually avoid um, repeating those mistakes. And that is pretty much uh, what my discussion will be about. And what I will do is once I kind of map out the kind of uh, the last 200 year, years trajectory of technological modernity in the West in 20 minutes, then I will open the, the floor for discussion. And then from there, we will discuss what an inclusive, non Eurocentric, uh, gender design could be. So hopefully uh, we can take it from there. So uh, let me begin and hopefully everything will work. So let me just uh, share the screen and uh, we'll share. So this is the title of my presentation and uh, I will uh, go into it, uh, gender design and gender leaky pipeline reflections on gender and Western technological modernity. In, the, in, in this intervention, I briefly outline the historical roots and institutional factors which have contributed to a chronic underrepresentation of women in sciences, technology, and see, I'm doing the admission as well. So it's, it's a, like multitasking, you know. Uh, technology reflected in such fields as the West. And I argue that a gender design for the global South must avoid the pitfalls of the masculinist 
Eurocentric scientific model, which has continued to militate against women in the global north. The leaky pipeline refers to a combination of low levels enrollments and higher rates of dropouts amongst women in the STEM fields in the West. In the West, this phenomena, it's really difficult to both administer and read. Ooh. In the West, this phenomena is often explained away by using spurious theories. <laughs> That's not funny. Spurious theories such as biological determinism as the cause of a lower representation of women and minorities in the STEM fields. However, widely available data in such sites as the UNESCO annual reports on STEM and gender show that biological determinism has nothing to do with success or failure in the STEM fields. Biological determinist cl determinists claim that on average, man's brain is more conducive to abstract the mastery of math and engineering, whereas on average, women's brain is more conducive to studying languages and memorization. However, if men have greater spatial or cognitive advantage over women, there should have been universally similar low enrollment of women in the STEM field, no such data exists. In some countries such as Russia, India, China, and the Middle East, women make up over 40% of all researchers in, and professionals in the STEM fields. The founder of Western sociology, Emil Durkheim, claims that biological differences between men and women was the necessary condition for orderly social organizations in modern societies. According to Durkheim, women's natural place was in the private sphere of care and domesticity. In the West, by the middle of the 19th century, Women were systematically removed from the skilled crafts and small trade they once dominated. Additionally, new philosophical and medical, uh, medical discourses were developed to back up the claim that women were in incapable of coping with the stresses and the strains of technological modernity. This spurious ideology shaped women's place in the Western capitalist societies political, economic, and organizational structures. They have also shaped capitalist patterns of education and pedagogical practices. In short, women were excluded from technological modernity. Mass inclusion of women in science education started after the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution. The Bolshevik Revolution created drastic social changes in many areas, one of which was the cancellation of gender-based segregated education system. This decision gave millions of women and girls access to education in the sciences such as medicine and engineering. Inclusion of women by the after the Bolshevik Revolution was class-based project that sought to overturn the order of the ruling elite. The 1929 Soviet technophilic film, A Man with a Movie Camera, showed a visual representation of the socialist belief that technology can be deployed to achieve a working class and a woman and technology were compatible. The Bolsheviks were not feminists. Instead, they believed that inclusion of women to science education was the necessary means through which women could be incorporated into the working class labor force. As a result, the Soviet Union encouraged girls and women to enter all fields in, in life, in public life, including education in sciences, mathematics, physics, and engineering. In the 20th century, Soviet education system produced millions of female scientists and engineers. The Western viewed women, view women were incompatible with modern, with modern technology, faced a critical stress when in 1963, the Soviet Union sent the first female to space. As a Russian blonde in space, Valentina Tereshkova's breakthrough became a focal point for feminists and others in the West who were calling for opening up the scientific field to women. As we enter the third decade of the 21st century, and despite decades of strong feminist pressure, women in the West are still facing obstacles in entering and thriving in the STEM fields under capitalism. 
Sadly, there are strong evidence that in the post-Soviet Russia and other ex-Soviet republics are also showing signs that women are steadily leaking out from the STEM fields. Despite the Global South produces the largest uh, number of IT specialists in the, in the world today, nevertheless, colonial era Eurocentric views that scientific mastery is a white masculine trait still shape Western scientific discourse. This persistent of Eurocentric influence on the STEM fields were underscored in 2017 when a white, soft, a white software engineer called James DeMore wrote and widely circulated a 10-page manifesto in which he railed against Google executives for trying to recruit and retain women and minorities. James DeMore claimed that women were underrepresented in the tech field, not because they face systemic bias and discrimination, but because of inherent psychological differences between men and women. DeMore went further by suggesting that it was a waste of time in, in, in educating women and girls in the STEM fields. He had similar misgivings about the inclusion of non-white people in software development and engineering programs. While Google fired the more sexist and racist discriminations are endemic problems in the STEM fields in the West. James DeMore became a hero for those who still believe that scientific, scientific mastery is a white masculine trait. Thus, in an opinion piece which appeared in the Global Mail, Deborah saw claimed that no, the Google manifesto is not sexist or anti-diversity, it is science. I now quote from Deborah Saw's opinion piece from the Global Mail. Scientific, study, scientific studies have confirmed that sex difference in the brain that lead to differences in our interest and behavior. As mentioned in the memo, gendered interests are predicated on exposure to prenatal testosterone. Higher the levels are associated with preference for mechanically interesting things and occupation occupations in childhood, in adulthood, sorry. Lower levels are associated with a preference for public people's oriented activities and occupations. This is why STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields tend to be dominated by men. This quote suggested that gender sex distinctions determine success in the STEM field and masculine advantage takes place inside the mother's womb. Now, I just want to summarize and say that I have outlined, briefly outlined, some historical roots and contemporary implications of Eurocentric masculine scientific, uh, techno-scientific model and how it continues to militate against women in, in the STEM fields in the, West, in, the, in the global north or the west. I have also briefly uh, referenced, um, you know, the, 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 the view of STEM and gender in, um, in communist Russia or uh, the bloc that actually accepted kind of technology was the tool of class, pow of, uh, class power, not gender so much. The real question we need to ask is what sort of design that can help women and other marginalized groups in the global south? This is in another way to say is how do we, how do we imagine gender inclusive design in the global south? This is a question which has no singular answer. It's a question which can only be addressed when designing itself is shaped by the values, interests, and the experiences of the users. What's clear is design embodies values and that gender is not a universal signifier. In this way, what counts as gender and what is, what is appropriate gender design cannot be declared, cannot be declared. Um, oh, I'm actually getting all these things that's just bothering me. What's, uh, uh, I don't uh, embodies values and gender is not a universal signifier. You see, multitasking, that's the woman thing. Uh, appropriate gender design can be decided outside of the social, political, and cultural context in which they take place and take shape and which they are asserted and resisted. 
Well, you know, this multitasking meant I didn't read my um, prepared statement as smoothly as I wanted, but I really would like now to stop the sharing and uh, I'm sorry if I rushed through the, uh, the reading, but I want to leave more time actually for the discussion. That's why I limit my presentation because I really do not have a prologomena. I don't have a, a, a blueprint of uh, how to design inclusive uh, gender design for the vast global south. And instead, I want to flag uh, some of the pitfalls we need to avoid. And therefore, I, I will now just stop the sharing. I will include all the references with this presentation and I will share and therefore uh, all of you can read it. Uh, so that's it. So uh, I, I prefer actually someone else moderate the, um, the chat because it's just... Uh, Thank you, Mina. Uh, Let me see if I can just make my... Could, could you um, click on the more options next to gender design and, and select make host and then I can take control again there. What do I, where should I press? Uh, okay, a participant or should, where, where should I go into? Security, no? Uh, under How the I participants see. list, if you could see gender design and then there should be options next to it, which are more. I just see the chat, so I don't see gender design here. I just see participant security, recording, breakouts. Can you see uh, my video? I see your video. I can only see you here. Okay. You just exclude me, like you take me out because I cannot see. Uh, I just see it then, oh, uh, here. Yeah, and then you've got three little dots. If you click those oh, three little dots and it should be make host. Well, can you like really take me out? Like, can, is there anything you can uh, do to take me out? Only, only you can do that. So if you just, if you see my video where gender design, if you hover over it in the top right hand corner, there should be three little dots. Oh, should I view here? So let me view. So what do I need? I just, I honestly don't see any gender design here. Where, where, do, should I, where should I go? Can you see gallery? Are you seeing just yourself? Or I go to the gallery view. No, I go into the gallery view. So here I see you. And then you might see me waving gender design, little video. Aha, I see you there. Yeah. Okay. And then the top right hand corner, there should be three little dots. Yes. And then you so should, what do I need to do? And then you should have. I can now see you. And then you have. What the, do I press? And then can you see the menu under the. the yes. Top? Dots and then if you click that, there should be the option to make host. Make host. So here I see stop video because I now see chat, pin, uh, spot everybody. Make host. Yes, I click that in and now change host. Yeah. So Should I press it? Yes. Oh, Whew. done. Forgive me. You were relieved of your duties, I suppose. Well done. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, I Amina. Mean, I'm going to uh, so back over to Chiara now. Okay. Uh, thank you, Amina. Thank you for your contribution and also for this um, funny exchange with um, Kerry too. That was um, um, nice to see. We, we're, everybody is learning here. Um, so uh, it's time for, uh, um, for um, some questions. If our um, if our audience had some uh, based on your uh, lectures, but also uh, if the audience had uh, additional questions, other kind of questions related to their research and obviously related to uh, that they can ask, they would like to ask to a gender expert for, uh, they can ask them, uh, them now. So I would like to, first of all to, um, to see if anybody uh, has questions. If not, I, I have a question. I, I'm sure also uh, Dominic probably has one. And so uh, you can, um, everybody, you can either post the questions or lift your hand uh, and uh, we will give you a voice if you prefer to pose the question yourself. Maybe people can speak. Maybe that's easier. Yeah, this is, yes, this is what I was suggesting, but maybe we need to warm up um, 
please, a little bit first. I know that uh, um, Dominique has a question, so I'll let her ask you her question, and then um, if there is, I have one myself. Okay, thank you, Amina. We only have 10 minutes to do this, so I'll do a 30 second question with a 30 second answer, I suppose. Uh, you spoke earlier on it, uh, about the communist influence uh, in the global south and how their ideas of uh, technology, um, education for all made for much more women uh, being trained and how now in with the diminution of communist influence there are less women being trained so i would like to hear you talking about maybe the possible limitations of their system of education and how if you were to wish for a, an open more open system now it might be different from the communist system or do you think that this was um, a good enough system uh, uh, when it was in full um, uh, deployment Thank you. Thank you. I think that uh, no system is ever full. That's actually, um, uh, 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 it's a given. So the Soviet system was definitely not uh, an ideal system. However, today, um, no other system whatsoever has developed women in the tech field anywhere else in the world. The facts speak for themselves. If you now look at the ex-Eastern uh, ex uh, states that were part of the Soviet Republic, here I'm talking about Slovakia, Slovenia, um, the Czech Republic, you know, those women are rating here. You just consult with uh, UNESCO data. There are more women in the IT field in Slovenia than in Great Britain. I mean, this is like, so, the, the, the mass inclusion of women in those fields has not been uh, surpassed. Uh, is, uh, do we need to repeat that? No, but the, the thing is we can start from there and see how do we actually take the best thing from that system and move forward. Yes. Thank you, Dominic. Um. We have a question from, and please forgive me for, for mispronouncing the name, uh, Merge Ayel. Uh, if you want, you can pose it yourself. If not, I'm going to read your question. No? Okay. Uh, so um, this person asks you, from your readings, where can we put the Global South view regarding gender matters? I think the Global South needs to pay attention to um, how still the word gender is a battleground in the, in, in the West. Like here you can see the fight is now went down to the bathrooms, you know, like, you know, women are fighting every step of the way. And as we fight for accessible bathrooms, they're teaching the children biological determinists and they're teaching them at Carlton University. By the way, uh, some of these people have confronted me in my courses on STEM and gender. So we need to find a ways in which we use empirical data, best practices, and not fall. The most important is not fall victims to 400 or 500 years of Eurocentric formula about gender and technology. So right from the get-go, if we guard against that, then definitely success and failure of women inclusive gender design will, will evolve in a ways that is equitable and fair to, to the local context. But it can never be one formula, yes. In, um, in this regard, um, you mentioned in your, um, in your lecture and uh, you said it now and we, we agree on this and it can be one formula, but if you were to do a research on gender design yourself, what would you pay attention to or be, yeah, this is, um, if it were you, what would you pay attention to? I would definitely pay attention to um, what what is the what what does it, it aim, enables? Does it enable um, uh, you know uh, 
uh, soft pleasure? Does it enable, you know, functionality? Does it enable that? Is it open to experiences? Like, for instance, one thing I borrowed from Ursula Franklin, which actually I should have incorporated in this, but I kept it maybe for the discussion is what Ursula Franklin distinguishes two types of, of technological practices, what she calls prescriptive technology. That's a technology that's hierarchical, um, you know, uh, up, way, down. The focus is efficiency, precision, control, and what she calls holistic uh, technology, technology that is dialectical and open to experiences, that is, you know, that can be changed, that is uh, 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 um, adaptable. So I definitely will include, uh, for instance, maybe a little, it's not quite uh, ideal analogous, but things like Wikipedia or open access, where people like can constantly edit. So something that's open to uh, attenuation and editing and fixing. In other words, I will center experience and experiential based uh, 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 updating as a, a, a key feature of any um, uh, gender friendly, justice oriented design. That it should be like, now, you see now in Canada, we are changing buildings that have no accessibility. When the, they were designed, nobody cared about accessibility uh, was an issue. Now they are, you know, fixing all these old buildings, you know. So it, if they were, you know, open to those inclusive needs long time ago, they would have created the, the situation. So in other words, the design will be collective, communal, and open ending, like they, it will be open to fixing, not up, down, not hierarchical, yes. So that is something I think that we can take from, you know, um, the great ecologist, physicist, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and definitely the um, great uh, uh, intellectual in terms of history of technology, uh, Dr. Ursula Franklin, um, her idea of um, holistic approach to, to uh, design is definitely something that we can borrow. And another thing I like to borrow from uh, Ursula Franklin is the metaphor of the bait worms. In other words, technological design today could be uh, 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 on the long haul. You might not see the fruits today, but in two, three decades, you will see the results being repeated many parts of the world. So in other words, you take this as uh, you know, uh, uh, fertilizing the, 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 the technological soil, if you, if you wish, creating the grounds of changing the mindset. So future generations will actually see this as necessary. They won't even, there will be very little debate. Consulting with the users, uh, incorporating the users as the design process will become therefore a second nature. Thank you. Thank you for this answer. It was quite, um, wow, I missed the word in English. Um, I would say illustrative. Not sure if it exists. Um, so we're mixing Italian, Portuguese, and English here. Um, anyway, there, we have a question from uh, Mariam Mustafa. Uh, sorry for mispronouncing the name. Please. Yes, thank you. That was good. <laughs> it, was, it was almost there. Um, yes, hi everybody. Uh, thank you, Amna, for your for your talk. Uh, that was really interesting. I am a researcher based in Pakistan, and I'm a computer scientist. And most of my work revolves around uh, designing technologies for women in Pakistan. Um, what I'm interested in understanding your thoughts on so in the Pakistani context, um, gender is 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 very layered, and so the oppressions that women face are not just because they're women. But they're they're mostly you know a large percentage of the female population is low literate or a large percent of them are also low income, and then they're also constrained by very specific patriarchal structures. So when we want to design for them, we have we have all of these constraints to work around. Um, so for example, most of the women have access to phones. That is the only access to some kind of technology, but it's a shared access. So our understanding of phones as private devices gets thrown out the window and we have to work with these very unique constraints. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious to um, sort of hear your thoughts on potential ways 
to design uh, for women in, a, in, in such very restrictive contexts, but also we've, you know, we've worked towards doing participatory design uh, with these populations and because they're low literate, because they have mobility constraints, um, because technology is not something they're very familiar with, we find that a very difficult thing to do. I agree with you. Is the, this is the same strategy that um, in Saudi Arabia, actually they can have internet and cell phones, but they cannot drive. So in the Saudi, they control the women's mobility by other means, such as, you know, uh, uh, like for instance, denying women the, 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 the right to drive. Again, that's another means of uh, controlling women's mobility. Definitely you're hitting on, um, on the head in what's going on in many parts of uh, the Muslim world and not only in Pakistan. It's a very difficult question for me to answer, but I definitely will say as a computer um, uh, programmer, start with what's there, the cell phones. See if you can include uh, features within that cell phone that maybe they can access things like Zoom or other things, you know, within that. And um, uh, start from there, Make, because the, the only thing you can do at that level is to include certain benign sounding subversive features in what's there and then take and see how that works and then take it from there. You cannot make a huge leap at that in such mm -hmm. a constrained environment, yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. We have uh, one last question from uh, Amanda Azevedo. Please, Amanda, if you are still online, because I cannot find you anymore, um, you have time for asking a question. Okay. And then, Hi, Amanda. Um, Hi there. Thank you, Amina. Hello Thank to you for your all. comment. <laughs> Uh, I'm speaking from Brazil. I'm sorry because I've lost. I my love Brazil so much. <laughs> I lost my connection, so yeah, I'm trying to readapt myself here. So, yeah, I would like to ask you, Amina. First of all, thank you for your presentation. You was really elucid elucidative. I don't know how to speak this, but oh, anyway, I will figure it. <laughs> Uh, I would like to ask you, because you spoke a lot about uh, designing technology and including uh, women and feminine perspectives of technology, but I would like to ask you, as a researcher, what do you think about uh, how are the strat uh, which are the strategies that we can apply in our research fields to look after the technologies that the women are already developing uh, to to exist, to resist in in their fights, in their struggles. I mean, I understand that uh, me as an engineer, I'm always thinking in technology in how to include women and how this technology can provide a bigger access to other women and other bodies in this matter there are not only the cis uh, white uh, gender body but i also would like to know what what can we do to look out and to put in our research uh, what is already uh, being developed by this woman you know because they they are still they they have their own technologies you know the the, they have the care technology and uh, how can we do to change this perspective of technology itself? I, I don't know if I'm... I, I think you know uh, your, your point is very, very clear. I have no problem of understanding you, by the way. Yeah, everything you said is very clear. I think uh, I will say two things. Uh, one is, whereas people like, you know, uh, um, J James Demore thinks, you know, uh, lack of testosterone or low testosterone makes us caring. I think we should actually say, oh, all right, I'm glad I don't have a lot of testosterone. Caring is good. So maybe turn the caring and caring technology as a badge of honor. So we design technology that incorporates caring. And I say, well, I'm glad my mother didn't give me enough testosterone, yeah? So we actually take up the care and incorporate it. Care and share and reciprocity and inclusivity into our technological designs. 
because what you are teaching you in the engineering globally is the same formula. You know, this, the formula, the Eurocentric formula is the formula that is globally taught. But if you now look at the, all this crap about, oh, there are no enough women at the Google because they harass the women. They kick them out, not because the women are there. They rape them, they harass them, they kick them out. If you now embrace the care and as the kind of feminine trait, in quotation, yeah? And incorporate it into things we design in this age of climate change, of pandemics, of whatever, let's take this as a value as we design things. I don't know if I'm making sense. 